Thank you so much for reading, Ella, and it's great to see you. My name is Mickey Mantle, if we haven't met before. I've got the great privilege of serving this congregation, and it's tremendous to see you here for the last of our series in Galatians. And it's been a wonderful time, I think, in this letter that speaks of Christ's radical grace to us, his radical rescue that brings a radical change in our lives. And um, right throughout, Paul has been painting for us two dramatic and contrasting realities, two separate worlds, right from the beginning of chapter one. I wonder if you remember back in chapter one, he spoke about our world, this present evil age, he called it, this brutal regime of oppressive worldly religion, a world of slavery that whether we know it or not, we are part of by nature, a world of unending to-do lists of religious ritual and moral rules and regulation. A world of having to wake up every day under the dark cloud of works and the law, of facing the burden every day of needing to justify ourselves by our performance, but only ever daily adding to the great mountain of our guilt before God. That's our world. That's where we belong by nature. That's the reality that we're all trapped in apart from Christ. Spiritual slaves marching to an eternal death. It's very sober as we see it across the pages of Galatians. Very sobering. But then there is this other beautiful reality that Paul has been painting across the pages of this letter. And he gives it finally a name here in chapter 6 verse 15. I wonder if we spotted it as we read. It is the new creation. It's this world of freedom under our loving Savior and his rule. It's the place where the shackles of religion have been shattered definitively. It's a place where the fountain of God's grace is unending to sinners. It's a place where we wake up every day, not under the heavy cloud and burden of works and law, but under the sunshine of knowing our fatherly, heavenly father's approval. A world where we don't need to justify ourselves by our works because we know we have been justified by the finished and final work of Jesus. A place where all of our sins have been buried with him in his death, never to be dug up again. The experience of walking through this life as sons of God, being able to cry out to the creator of all the universe as father, having the spirit of Christ himself poured into our hearts and guiding us and leading us home to eternity. These two dramatic contrasting realities What a joy it is to be a Christian and to be freed by Christ. And all of it hinges on this one thing, which is the subject of these verses, which Paul has begun with in chapter 1 on this issue, the cross. The cross which has come crashing into the prison of our world and has broken down its chains at its gates and has liberated anyone who would trust in him to join the new creation. It was back there in chapter 1, you'll remember, at the very beginning, Christ who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age. And it's kept on surfacing time and time again throughout the letter. Christ who loved us and gave himself for us. Christ who took the curse of the law upon himself in his death. And here again, it is the key subject of these closing words. Verse 12, it's there. It is the cross that brings persecution. And again, in verse 14, it is the cross of Christ that Paul will boast in and calls us to boast in because the cross of Christ brings us to the new creation. These are Paul's closing words, but they're not just an addendum, a bit of postscript. He doesn't want us to close off and shut down. Everything he set up to this point has been dictated to one of his secretaries. But now Paul gets up He moves the assistant aside and he picks up the reed pen himself and he begins writing in his own hand and with large letters. You see that in verse 11? See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It's the equivalent of bold, caps, 23 points, double underlined. And what he wants us to grasp in these final verses is these two very different approaches to the one same thing, the cross of Christ. He wants us to adopt the one and resist the other. Because one leads to slavery and eternal death, 
and the other keeps us free and heading towards the new creation. It couldn't be more important. And the first approach is the wrong approach, and that is the approach of these enslavers, these Jewish false teachers who want the cross hidden. And it's there in verses 12 and 13. I wonder if you'd look with me to verse 12. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. What Paul is doing here is to pull off the mask of these Jewish Christian false teachers. They're the ones, as we've seen here in verse 12, who are trying to force the Galatian Gentile Christians to adopt circumcision and the Mosaic law, those who force you to be circumcised. They are enslavers, that's what I'm calling them, because they're trying to bring the Galatians back under the slavery of the law, of this present evil age, of religion, in this case, Jewish religion. And now Paul finally gives us an insight, after all these chapters, into their motivation. What is it that is causing them to do this? Why are they becoming these enslavers? Why are they forcing the Galatian Gentiles back into the slavery of the law? And the answer that we learn is that they want to hide the cross. They want to hide the cross and so avoid the persecution of the cross. We're going to spend most of our time in these couple of verses. It takes a bit to get our heads around. I'd like to ask you to strap in and concentrate, but it will help us unlock the rest of the passage and see Paul's contrast in the way that he approaches the law. And the key phrase, I think, is there in verse 12, in the middle. They who would force you to be circumcised do so only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. I wonder if you notice the surprise there and the implication. These people are Christians in some sense. They're forcing the Galatians to take on circumcision, but they themselves in some sense accept the cross of Christ. Compromised Christians, yes, but Christians. We saw that hinted back in chapter 1. They preached a gospel. Do you remember that? A distorted gospel, but yes, some sort of gospel, something about Christ. You see, they were Jews who grasped what was obvious to anyone who listened to the truth of Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah. Incidentally, if you're here tonight looking into the claims of Jesus, when you look into Jesus in the light of the Old Testament, you cannot but see that he is the one who is the Messiah promised in the Old Testament. It is obvious for anyone to see if you look into the evidence clearly. And that is what these Jews grasped. Jesus is the Messiah and the cross matters. And here in verse 12, though, they want to avoid the persecution of the cross. Yes, they grasp it in some sense, but they want to avoid its persecution. So we can imagine it was something like this. They, they came up to these Galatian Christians, perhaps down from Jerusalem, coming all that way, and said to them, yes, we agree with you. Jesus is the Messiah. Yes, we agree with you. The cross is important. But what we also need, what our people have also and always done, is to obey the law, to be circumcised. And you Gentiles too need to do that. The cross by itself is not enough, I'm afraid. You need the law on top to be saved. It's a sort of gospel, a distorted gospel. The cross of Christ, but also the law to be saved. But what is their motivation? Well, Paul says it is to avoid persecution from their fellow Jews. And the first thing we need to grasp is that the cross is such an offense. It is a terrible offense to human pride because of what it says about us as human beings. It strikes to the very heart of our human pride. It says that the world and world religion is bust. It says to us that our attempts as human beings to justify ourselves and make ourselves right through this world system of religion is a lost cause. It's a bust flush. As human beings, by contrast, we are so sinful, so incapable of climbing up to God, of making ourselves good by our works, that we need something far, far, far more radical. We need a rescue. We need someone to rescue us. Ronald Reagan, who was a former president of the United States, worked as a lifeguard in the summers in California as a, as a teenager. 
And in that period, he rescued apparently 77 people from drowning. And in one of his memoirs, he notes down the strange experience of time and again people being very angry at him once he had rescued them. And that is because human beings don't like the idea that we need help. It strikes to the heart of our human pride. It tells us that we need rescuing, and we hate that idea. And the same is with the cross. The reason the cross is so offensive and so different to human religion, all of them, is because it tells human beings that we desperately need a rescue, that we cannot help ourselves. And it's that truth, that offensive truth, that these Jewish Christians wanted to keep quiet, wanted to keep hidden, wanted no one else to know about, because it brought persecution. And the way to hide the offense of the cross is by covering it over with the plasters of human religion. If you add to the outward forms of worldly religion, you can muffle the message of the cross. With the plasters of human religion, human pride can be left intact and unthreatened. You can look like you're conforming to everyone else around, that you're a legalist like everybody else by human nature that you're conforming to this world's human system of self-justification. Other non-Christian Jews weren't bothered, it seems, that this group of Christian Jews had an interest in the Messiah. That was a kind of quirk, a kind of peculiarity that they were interested in. That, That wasn't a big deal. Just as long as they kept conforming to Judaism, as long as they kept on having the outward show of operating according to the same system of religious works. It was all about keeping up appearances. You get that in verse 12. They are those who want to make a good showing in the flesh. That phrase, a good showing, is literally a good face. They wanted to appear outside to outsiders, to other Jews, as law keepers. Well, verse 13, it isn't really about an interest in keeping the law per se. Verse 13, for even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law. It's not actually about keeping the law, it's about appearing to keep the law so that you won't offend others. Appearing to play the world's game of self-justification. If you will, please turn back to chapter 5, verse 11 and see the same dynamic going on. Chapter 5, verse 11. Paul says, But if I, brothers, still preach circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been removed. You see what Paul is saying? If I chose to preach circumcision as a necessity, if I went around to the Jews and to the Gentiles saying, you need to and you can be circumcised to add to your justification, there would be no problem for Paul. But it was because Paul was saying the cross and the cross alone is all you need. That was the message that was so offensive. You don't need any human religious works, not even circumcision and the law. And that kind of message strikes at human pride. And anyone who believes it, anyone who preaches it, anyone who lives it by lip and life will be persecuted, just as Paul was. And the same is the case today. So many Christians and churches hide the cross out of fear of persecution. Sure, in some sense, secretly holding to the theology of the cross, but covering over it with plasters of worldly religion, hiding the truth, the offensive truth of the cross. It could be through the distraction of traditional religious ritual, of ceremonies and festivals, of just the humdrum of religious practice. I think the world increasingly sees that kind of thing as just a bit quirky and strange, but it's inoffensive, and it means that people can be left alone to themselves and irrelevance. But I think the more pressing and common way that we see it today in the West is for churches and Christians and Christian leaders to apply the plasters of secular Western culture to hide the cross. Now, we mustn't be mistaken. Our secular Western culture is a profoundly religious system that belongs to this world, that is native to this world, and is just like the religious systems of this world. It has its high priests in the media and in politics and in public life. It has its own set of virtues and standards that must be obeyed. There is punishment for disobedience and ostracism. There is reward for conformity. It is a merit system 
just like every other system of religion of this world, and it ranks human beings in just the same way. And to avoid persecution, Christians and Christian leaders and churches are always tempted to hide the offense of the cross, to boast about our obedience to the religion of the secular culture and cover over the reality of the offensive message of Jesus' death. Just think for a moment about about the kinds of things some of our own Anglican leaders speak about when they have the chance, when they're interviewed in the media. What do they speak about when they're given the chance? Well, of course, they preach the gospel, don't they? They teach about the universal reality of sin and the fact that Jesus and his death is the only way and only hope for anyone in this country and in this world to be saved. Do they? No, you don't hear that because that would mean persecution. I've heard it from our African brothers, Bishop Ben Kwashi, who was here a few months ago, who stands up whenever he has the chance and preaches about the Lord Jesus Christ and the need for salvation. And for him, that really means persecution. In northern Nigeria, that means death for people he knows and the risk of death for himself. Now, when we hear about the plasters that cover up, no, instead what we hear from our leaders, and so much in the West, is all the plasters of this world's religion that makes Christianity palatable. You know the subjects that will come up, the things that will win applause from the high priests of our secular culture. Brexit, economic injustice, the environment, social action, human sexuality, where the message is only the half-truth of radical inclusion, but misses out the radical repentance which Jesus makes possible with his radical love and his radical grace. And on that topic, the authentic message of Jesus is the only one that gives real hope to sexual sinners like me and like all of us. But of course, it goes beyond just conforming themselves to protect themselves. It is an aggressive and evangelistic program Just like these Jews in Galatia, they want to go and grab anyone and conform anyone and domesticate anyone who dares to speak openly about the cross because of what it will say to others about that message and the way that it will reflect badly on them. Look with me, if you will, to the end of verse 13 to show why these enslavers were so keen on getting the Galatians to be circumcised. Verse 13 at the end. But they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. You see, the enslavers arrive in Galatia and they seem to be genuinely concerned for the Galatians. You remember in this letter how they've been approaching them. Back in chapter 1, verse 10, they've been saying something like this. Paul didn't give you the full message. He soft-pedaled you the message because he wanted you to like him. He didn't tell you about the hard truth of circumcision and the need to go under that kind of law. Well, chapter 4, verse 17 We read about how they made much of the Galatians, how they were very friendly and kind and and nice. But what appeared to be genuine concern was not genuine at all. Their real interest was in saving their own skins and avoiding persecution from other Jews. And to do that, they were boasting about the Galatians as their trophies, showing them how that they had managed to domesticate them, showing them how they had gone to these Gentiles and made them act and behave like Jews according to the religion of this world in order to hide the offense of the cross. They wanted the Galatians to adopt the badges of religion so that, verse 13, they could boast in their flesh. If the Galatians were allowed to continue on saying and living as if the cross and the cross alone is all that matters, then that would have tarred these others with the same brush. It would have brought persecution. It would have let the cat out of the bag. It would have exposed the real message of the cross, which says that human beings have nothing to bring except our sin. And so in order to protect themselves, these Jewish Christians went on an aggressive mission to domesticate and conform others to outward signs of worldly religion and hide the cross and save their skins. And again, I want to say the same dynamic is happening today in our circles It will always be the case with compromised churches and compromised Christian leaders. Because those who stick to the offensive message of the cross as front and center, as our agenda, as the thing that we're on about, 
are going to cause others problems because we risk bringing them into persecution by association, by letting the cross out of the bag. It's always been the case, and it's here the case at St. Helens. We're not always perfect at this, but we desperately want to be a church that keeps speaking openly and honestly and clearly about the offense of the cross. The one thing, the one way that humans can be saved. And if you've been around for a while, you'll be aware how William, our rector, and I can speak in his absence, how he is under constant pressure from compromised Christian leaders to add the acceptable pastors of this world's religion, which would mean obscuring the cross. Oh yeah, they appear very nice when they approach us to do it. But the motive is the same as here in Galatia. Verse 12, only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. Verse 13, that they desire to have you circumcised, to adopt the plasters of this world's religion, so that they may boast in your flesh. And the fact that he doesn't do it is why William is so hated. And in his absence, we can be grateful for the way that God has kept him firm and resisting that pressure. And let's keep on praying for him, for our sake, and for other Christian leaders who do the same in this country and in the world, because it is so vitally important, especially as the pressure mounts. But it's not just Christian leaders, it's us as individuals. For the rest of our Christian lives, we will face this kind of pressure in all sorts of ways. The pressure to be less awkward, the pressure to be less adamant about the cross as the thing that this world needs and the thing that we boast in because it is the thing that has saved us. But we must never give in because as we've seen through Galatians, it is impossible to have Christ and religion. You cannot trust in the cross and trust in yourself at the same time. And what begins as an outward show to protect ourselves very soon becomes an inward reality. And as that happens, we lose Christ, we're severed from him, we're severed from grace. It is a real and scary pressure that we face, but there is a way to avoid it. And that's what Paul outlines in these final following verses. Enslavers want the cross hidden, but secondly, and more briefly, the free will boast in the cross. So we've seen Paul expose these enslavers and the doom, way, the doom of their approach, their way of wanting to hide the cross. But as he closes, he turns now to showing us this alternative approach, his approach, the way that we'll be able to stand firm and remain in the joy and the freedom of the gospel. Look with me, please, to verse 14. But far be it from me to boast. That is, to boast like they do in the flesh, in religious performance. Far be it from me to boast, except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul will boast. And it's deliberately ironic. He boasts in the one thing that says to this world that sinful human beings like him and us have nothing to boast in. And the reason is verse 14. Because by it, by the cross, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. What happened at the cross of Christ 2,000 years ago was that Jesus was crucified. The Sunday school knows that. But at the same time, in a mysterious but very profound and true way, that was also the moment when the world, this present religious system, was crucified the cross generated the obituary notice of this present evil age. We get hints of that in the rest of the Bible. John chapter 12, verse 31, if you're taking notes. Jesus says, now, just before his crucifixion, now is the judgment of this world. Well, think to Mark's gospel and Matthew's gospel, just after Jesus' death, after he breathes his last. What happens? The temple curtain is torn in two from top to bottom. The cross crucified, the cross ended, the cross tore down in judgment the religious system of this world. And what is true for Paul is also true for us. Because by it, by the cross, the world has been crucified to you and to me and us to this world. What does that mean? It means that religion and ritual and performance and the system of this world of slavery to works and justification 
by my actions, that whole miserable system that condemns everyone who is part of it, that system has been nailed to the cross and crucified. No more hold over us. We are free. Verse 15, For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. All of those things, all of those rituals, all of those things that belong to that world are useless. Ritual conformity to religion, circumcision or non-circumcision, any of it, just does not matter at all anymore. It is part of a defunct and in the trash can, over and out way of operating. We've been set, from the, set free from this present evil age and now by faith and faith alone, we belong to the new creation. And so verse 16, and as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Before there was a whole warehouse of rules and regulations, but now Paul says there is just one rule, one rule, and that is the rule of the cross of Christ. As those who walk by that one rule, which means clinging to the cross, independence, depending on the cross for all of our security and nothing to do with our human effort and action. It means that we have peace with God. That extraordinary experience of going from being enemies of our creator to having peace with him and having him as our father. We have peace with God. We have the mercy of God. The mercy of God towards us, which means that no sin that we have committed in the past or ever will commit is too big and isn't covered by his gracious mercy to us. And it means, verse 16, that we now are the Israel of God. Right throughout this letter, we've seen that the Jews and the Jewish enslavers argued that the law and circumcision, that was the thing that made you a child of Abraham. That was the thing that made you part of God's family and his people. But do you see what Paul is saying now? He's saying there is one thing that makes you part of the family of God, and that is the cross of Christ, and that alone. That makes you... Here tonight, the people of God. That makes us the Israel of God. And in verse 17, Paul begins to conclude by saying this, From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul is telling us the stark reality of what we've seen before. The world hates the cross. It is a great offense. For Paul, that meant stonings and beatings because he would not shut up about the cross. For us, it may not be like that. It could be, but more likely it's going to be the unseen but real scars of going through this life as somebody who stands by the cross. If you want to be liked as a Christian, I'm afraid you've gone to the wrong saviour because the world will hate us if we stand by the cross and the world will hate us like it hated our saviour. Suffering, but not alone and not in vain because of verse 18. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. He's speaking to people who have teetered so close to the edge of oblivion, but they're still brothers, still Christians, still by the grace of God, those who are his. And that has been the theme tune of this letter, grace, God's undeserved mercy and kindness to us from beginning to end. Grace at the beginning that first saved us. Grace in the middle that carries us on through his Holy Spirit every day of our lives. And grace that will mean that we meet him ready to be welcomed into his new creation. And until that day, we are to be those who are like Paul, who boast in the cross of Christ. What do we boast in? I did a bit of self-examination. I won't tell you what it is. It's too embarrassing. But it's all sorts of things that we boast in. Our achievements, our gifts, our reputations, our track record of Christian service, our knowledge of the Bible. But none of those things matters. None of those things saves us. We have only one thing that saves us, one thing to boast in, and that is the cross of Christ. That is what has rescued us. That is what has brought us to his new creation. And to be those who are free, to be those who for the rest of our lives resist the enslavers to be brought back into this present evil age, we need, like Paul, to be those who boast in the cross of Christ to ourselves, to each other, 
to boast in this one thing, that he has done it all, and to depend on him, and nothing to do with our religious works, our own performance, achievements, reputation, or whatever it happens to be. Yes, it will mean suffering. It meant that for Paul. It meant that for the Lord Jesus. But it is the way of joy. It is the way of peace. It is the way of freedom. Why don't we close in prayer now and pray that we would be those people. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. We thank you, our Father, for this precious reality of the cross of Christ. We admit our sin and our unworthiness before you. We admit that nothing that we do, none of our pride or none of our reputation, none of our contribution has done anything to save us except for this one precious thing, the cross of Christ. And we pray that by your grace, you would make us those who boast in it for the rest of our lives. That we, from now on, until that day we meet with you, would boast in the cross and the cross alone. And we pray for Jesus' sake and for his glory. Amen. Good. Lots of questions here. Um, Far more than we're going to have time to answer, but I'll do my best to put a reflective sample to Mickey and let's carry on these conversations afterwards it'll be great for us to keep chatting these things over um, and by all means come up and ask Mickey uh, if we don't get to your question and Mickey just a clarification question on what you said tonight if the false teachers are Christians then are they saved and if so what's all the fuss about Hmm. yeah it's a kind of murky area isn't it but I'm persuaded that in some sense they accepted Jesus as the Messiah in some sense they, they agreed to the idea of the cross as being important. And I think that comes in that key verse that we looked at, in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. There's some risk that they might be, which indicates that somehow they are, in some sense, Christian. But I don't think that they can be saved because they have definitively moved over to that other system, back into slavery, into the law. And I think we get that in chapter 5, verse 2. Paul says, look, I say to you, that if you accept circumcision, you Gentiles, Christ will be of no advantage to you. And he goes on, you are severed from Christ, you who would be, about to be, justified by the law, you've fallen away from grace. And so there's this tipping point where the Gentile Galatians are on the very edge of, that they're about to slip into. And for them, if they accept circumcision, that is to say, I accept the whole system of works religion, adding that to Christ. And it seems that these these Jewish Christians who are trying to win them over have already accepted that and have already given in to that whole system. And therefore, they seem to be, this category of chapter 5, verse 2, accepting this system of worldly um, religion. I don't think this is a case of us then looking, navel-gazing into ourselves and saying, oh, am I somebody who has slipped into the Galatian heresy? That's That's not the issue. No, the whole tenor of this letter and the whole thrust of this letter is to is to say to us don't go that way don't fall into don't convert to roman catholicism don't become a secularist and that you are within the sphere of god's grace you are within um by god's grace a church which is preaching this message of justification by faith alone and keep sticking to it don't be bullied into going into some other system of religious works great Uh, thanks mickey um Questions about, um, uh, I guess, connected to what you've just said. How do we make sure that, how do we apply it to ourselves? So just kind of building on what you, you finished then. How do we apply it to ourselves rather than just those out there, kind of Roman Catholics or mm-hmm. uh, those who are teaching these things that are capitulating to culture? Yeah, well, I think it is to, uh, it is to examine ourselves and to ask ourselves those questions about why do we do the things that we do in Christian activity? Why do we go to RML groups and why do we go to... If it's because in our hearts we think we're building points with God, that is a grave mistake because that's not actually what is happening. These are gifts given to us, God's word, his people, um, prayer, all things that are gifts to us to sustain us and keep us going in the Christian life. 
But I don't think that's the main application. That, that is a sort of tendency and a secondary application. I think the main application to us and where we sit in this letter is the, as those who are like the Galatian uh, Gentiles, who are under pressure from religion and secular religion to give up on Christ and trusting in him, to give up on the offensive cross. And so I think that's the application for us because there'll be all manner of ways, whether from our family or friends or work colleagues, uh, you know, into the future, where we'll be pressured to go soft and to, to, to go for comfort and to avoid the offense of the cross. But what we're being called to do is, is to see how dangerous that is and how that means stepping into slavery and this world which led, leads, to, um, leads to corruption, as Paul says, and instead to stick to the cross and to boast in the cross in our hearts, in our minds, and every day in a mundane way but keep on trusting in the cross. You've said a few times tonight that the cross is offensive. A yeah. few people asking, can you explain exactly what is the offense of the cross? And then a connected question of, does that mean that every time we uh, proclaim the gospel, it should offend people? Should we kind of always be hated or mm -hmm. even aim to be hated? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's easy I, I, yeah, for me to be hated. No. Um, I think, yeah, the offense of the cross. The offense of the cross um, chapter 5, verse 11, uh, is, is the raw message that Christ had to be cursed for us. That message, chapter, uh, what are we to in chapter 2? Chapter 3. Chapter 3 says this. Um, chapter 3, verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And so because Jesus was our substitute, because he had to do that, it speaks to us and to the world that we should have been there on the cross. Uh, John Stott, who uh, has written a commentary on this, says something. This is a sort of loose, loose um, estimation of what he says. But every time I look at the cross, I should be saying to myself, I deserve to be there. I should have been crucified on the cross. I should have been paying for my sins because I'm a sinner who deserves judgment. And that message is so offensive to human beings. We hate it, because we don't like the idea that we're sinners, and we don't like the idea that we can't help ourselves. And that is what the cross proclaims. The real message of the cross says to the world that you are hopeless beggars, and you can offer nothing except your sin for your salvation, and you can, you can boast in nothing except for what God has done, to you, done for you. And so I think that is the offense of the cross. We hate it. All human religion hates it whether secular or, or non-secular. Um, and so when I preach, the, preach the, the, the cross, no, I want to preach um, Christ in all of his beauty, uh, and I want to speak about um, what he has done, but I will want to get to the cross because that is where God's wisdom and that is where God's power is. Chapter 1 and 2 of 1 Corinthians gets onto this same idea, this idea that somehow if I can sort of fool people into thinking there are aspects of Christianity, sort of hide the cross and make Christianity look really impressive and powerful by, by bringing up people on the stage who are really impressive and powerful and showing them all my impressive and powerful friends and showing them how wise I am through my understanding of world, um, uh, worldview and philosophy and how reasonable the Christian worldview is. If I'm trying to do that and hiding the cross, I'm saying I'm cleverer than Jesus and I'm saying that I'm more powerful than Jesus. I want to impress them with all my things and then introduce them later to my offensive friend Jesus. But that's not how it works. The power is in Jesus and in his death and his offensive message. So at some point, not because I'm trying to be offensive, but if I'm faithful, I will be offensive to some. But some will hear that as, um, as, as deeply offensive. But, but to others, it will be the, the aroma of life. And that's just the dynamic. If you're, if you're, in, if you're a Christian and you're in the business of telling others about Christ, and I'm afraid that's what we're all in, the business of doing, uh, and it's a great business, we will be hated by the world. That's just, that's just the way it is. That's really helpful. And so not aiming to be hated, no. but aiming to proclaim the cross, even though that will be offensive to yeah. some. Yeah. Yeah. But wonderful to see how, to so many through the New Testament, it's not offensive to everyone. I guess lots of us here can, can say we are thrilled by the message of the death of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And so we want to be making yeah. that known. Uh, lots of questions connected to, to recent passages. I guess just time for one a quick question. Can you just 
I'd tell us, you told us a few weeks ago about living by the Spirit from Galatians 5. Mm. Can you just give us more of an idea of what it looks like to live by the Spirit? Mm. And how do we make sure that doesn't end up looking like works through the back door? Yeah. Tim, what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a tricky, it's a tricky passage. I think chapter yeah, 5, if you turn to it, chapter 5, starting at verse 16... Paul says, but I say to you, walk by the Spirit. And in the first place, that can't be disconnected to what he's said back in chapters 1 to 4. That is, in the first place, walking by the Spirit is walking through life knowing I'm a justified person. Knowing that by faith in Christ alone, I am somebody who belongs to Christ, who has the Spirit of Christ, who has the Spirit of Christ and knows God as Father. That is the primary thing. But walk does seem to speak about an an action in some way. And back down in chapter Uh, 5 verse 25, if we live by the Spirit, that is, if we've been made alive by the Spirit, which we have been, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. And again, that speaks of some sort of response. It's not a response of works. We're already saved. We're already justified people. But now, as those who have the Spirit of Christ in us, we will want to and will be given the desires to begin to be able to, in a way that we never could before, um, echo the life of Christ and and exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, and so on and so forth. Against such things there is no law. No law can produce those things, and no law stands against those things. That is the description of Jesus Christ, and because Jesus is in our hearts by his Spirit, he begins to produce that fruit in us. And again, in a wonderful way, fruit speaks about something that just will happen um, over time. But at the same time, chapter 5, verse 17, there are these conflicting desires. The desires of our sinful human flesh that is still in us, but also these new desires of the Spirit, which we can feed and which we can act upon and which we can follow and which, verse 18, we can be led by. So the Bible doesn't give us sort of neat, systematic answers. It's saying both. It's saying that, yes, we have been justified, absolutely, that we are absolutely the sons and daughters of God. But at the same time, now we have the privilege of acting upon these good desires that Christ has given us. And those desires aren't just sort of out there or in our hearts disconnected. They are the same desires that are spoken of and outlined in the scriptures, which themselves have been authored by the voice of the Spirit. So that is the dynamic of the Christian life. Every day, knowing that I'm in this fierce battle, that I have the sinful human flesh wanting me to feed it, but depending on him, coming to him for forgiveness, relying on him, and acting on those desires he's given us in our hearts, which are the desires of Christ. Um, We won't be perfect this side of heaven, um, but we can expect progress. We can expect that he will change us. Tim, do you have anything to say there? I think, I guess, another way of just thinking about it is to say we often think the way to fight um, sin, to fight uh, the temptations that are spoken about uh, in chapter 5 is is to think, well, I must do this if I'm going to be saved, and the kind of the works-based religion approach to, to, to fighting sin. And if I'm not going that route, then I'll just give in and give in to temptation. And the, the kind of the two options are either pursuing works or living how I want. And therefore, the question comes out of that assumption. If I'm not pursuing works, then I'm going to live how I want. If I'm not living how I want, then I'm going to be pursuing works. And Paul's answer is, no, you've got it completely mixed up. Realize that this radical change has happened to you. You have died to this world. Again, in tonight's passage, I have been crucified to the world, verse 14. Mm. Uh, Back in chapter 2, we saw that we have been crucified with Christ. Mm. Uh, That's 2, verse uh, 20. This radical change has happened. I no longer belong to this world, which means I don't go about things in a worldly way, pursuing uh, works to be right with God, but I also don't go about works of the flesh that belong to this world. Mm. Mm. Uh, that list yeah. in chapter 5. And if I belong to this new creation, if I belong to this realm of the Spirit, if I live by him, and I do because I'm a believer, 
then let me live in the way that he's um, empowering me to live. And that will always be a battle until Jesus comes back. That's the, the conflict in verse 17. But where do I think I am? Who do I think I am? Where do I think I belong? And Paul is urging us to have this radical sense of disconnect from this present evil age, which I guess all of us struggle with because we see ourselves in this world. We see ourselves just like our friends, our neighbors. And Paul says, if you're a Christian here, a huge change has happened and the problem we are all vulnerable to is thinking that we are still belonging to this present evil age. Mm -hmm. Wake up, realize who you are, where you are. Uh, realize that change has happened. That's very helpful. Yeah. Um, just one last question then, um, before we sing to close. Could you sum up the message of Galatians <laughs> in a sentence? Uh, there's a word limit suggested here. Seven words. <laughs> well, that's what they say. I wasn't going to challenge you to that. Um, I'm going to go to, to an apostolic... Uh, Maybe 14 words. Um, chapter 5, I think, I've been thinking about this. I think that as good a, a, a summary verse of Galatians as I can find is chapter 5, verse 1. And chapter 5, verse 1 says this, For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And so that brings in, in all we've seen, I think, across the chapters of the threat of slavery. That's the reason the letter has been written, because there are some who want to enslave these Christians and bring them back under religion and all the condemnation that brings. But Paul says, no, you've been freed. You've been justified. Christ has set you free. The spirit of the new creation has been poured into your hearts. You belong there. And therefore now stand firm and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. Don't go back um, to that world because you belong to this other world. And it is a wonderful gospel, isn't it, that we have. Um, and it's a, I want to encourage us to keep on going back to Galatians and chewing over it. We, we, in a series like this, we can't cover everything, of course, um, but we have great opportunity to keep on going back and seeing this wonderful, radical gospel um, that is uh, just so marvellous. Great. Thank you very much, Mickey.